like, so the weather is a little bit better than usual. We were saying that like every Wednesday is first of the month. It's been terrible weather since we started, since I started doing this. So we gets better next week. Um, so today we have um, Polly Sharma, who is a graduate student at the University of Ottawa. Uh, she's doing her MA-PhD program in experimental psychology, and she's doing the imaging portion of her research study here with us at the Brain Imaging Center. And her group has partnered with um, Dr. Anna Smith to help with the imaging portion of the study, and there's one of our fMRI helpers and researchers here. Um, so she's going to talk about the research project that she's working on, and um, we have it today, so I'm excited to see. So I'll get started. So can everyone hear me okay? All right, perfect. So my name is Rapali, and um, I'm currently doing one of the studies for my PhD thesis at the Brain Imaging Center here. Um, so yeah, thank you for having me at uh, this month's seminar, and I look forward to sharing my preliminary data with you guys for a study that I've been working on. So the title of my presentation today is The Effects of Early and Late Onset Oral Contraceptives on brain structure and emotional working memory. So this is the outline that I've prepared for today's presentation. I'll start off by introducing you all to what exactly oral contraceptives are, and, and then I'll move on to the existing research on them. Uh, I'll then be speaking a little bit about puberty and how it's an important period of development, and finally, my current study, the preliminary results I've received so far, and my discussion and some conclusions that I can draw based on my preliminary results. So just to start off a little bit about myself, I know Katie um, introduced me, so I'm in my third year of the experimental program um, in the Faculty of Social Sciences at Iwadwa, and I'm supervised by Dr. Nafisa Ismail, who is the director of the Neuroimmunology, Stress, and Endocrinology Lab, and she's actually sitting right here today, um, so she came to my talk, uh, so yeah. So to get right into it, what are oral contraceptives? So the combined oral contraceptive pill is one manifestation of synthetic hormones and it constitutes a form of birth control. It's a prescription medication and it typically contains anywhere from 0.02 to 0.04 milligrams of ethanol estradiol and varying levels of synthetic progestins. Um, combination oral contraceptives can also be further divided into different categories such as newer generation, second generation, and older generation, and the hormone content in them can be divided into different types like monophasic, biphasic, and triphasic. I have an example of one here, Yasmin 28. You might have seen it come up in popular news and media recently. So this is an example of a newer generation birth control pill and the hormone content is monophasic, meaning that the hormones delivered are consistent throughout the entire birth control pack. And surprisingly enough, birth control has actually been in the market since the 1960s, but very little is known about how it affects uh, the brain and behavior. So there is research starting to be done on it just now. And right now in Canada, it's considered the number one contraceptive method and it's used by over 100 million women worldwide, which really drives home the point as to why we should be looking at this and its potential effects it can have on brain and behavior. So the role of oral contraceptives is to suppress endogenous gonadotropins and sex hormones, thereby preventing women from experiencing a natural menstrual cycle. So the synthetic hormones in the birth control pill prevent the release of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, which essentially prevents ovulation from occurring. And the synthetic progestin in the oral contraceptive pill also helps to thicken cervical mucus, making it more difficult for sperm to penetrate the egg. And what we see in the research right now is that the use of synthetic hormones likely alters brain structure and physiology. And we can come to this agreement because we do know from the research that sex hormones do act as neuromodulators. So they have roles in brain development and processes like neurite growth and myelination. 
Uh, currently in the research right now, we show that women on birth control display increased regional gray matter volumes, and some of the areas identified are the prefrontal cortex, parahippocampal, and temporal gyri. Another more recent study also found that the birth control pill was associated with significant uh, decreases in cortical thickness, predominantly in the orbitofrontal cortex and posterior cingulate cortex, and these regions are important because they help us respond to rewards, for example. A preliminary DTI study actually found that women on the pill show increased mean diffusivity in the fornix, and this region also is noteworthy because it's involved in the limbic process, and it helps us process emotional information. And finally, women on the pill have been shown to display different brain activity patterns depending on various tasks. Uh, and this is in relation to women who are not using the pill and also to men. So, despite the recent evidence suggesting that birth control plays a role in altered brain structure and function, most studies to date have only been conducted on a young adult population. And so my lab thinks that this is an important misstep in research because women are actually starting to use the birth control pill at a younger age, predominantly during the sensitive neuroplastic pubertal period. And the emerging trend to use birth control at a younger age can be attributed to their increased marketability as regulators. So I have examples of two ads that have been found in popular media and what pharmaceutical companies are really trying to emphasize is that the oral contraceptive pill goes beyond birth control. So it can help a young woman regulate her mood, her skin, and her menstrual cycles. Uh, this is an example of a recent review that was published recently and it really drives home the point that we need to be considering the use of hormonal contraception more in psychological studies as well as MRI studies. Um, this article mentions that birth control has been around since the 1950s and 60s, but very little is known about its effects on brain structure and function. And this article also highlights the point that the age of first contraceptive use is constantly decreasing down to puberty and that we should be looking at its long-term effects. And so what is puberty exactly? Puberty is a shift from a non-reproductive to reproductive state. So it can typically be seen as the initiating event of adolescence, which is a time of social, cognitive, and emotional maturation. For females, menarche is a central event of puberty, which is the first occurrence of menstruation. And the influx of endogenous estrogen and progesterone during this time not only make a woman reproductively capable, but also play a role in brain development. So the research has shown that the influx of female sex hormones significantly contribute to brain remodeling and reorganization and can really set the stage for long-term brain functioning and onset of mental health conditions later on. So for example, what the research has shown is that before puberty, girls are equally or even less likely to become depressed than boys. However, afterwards, girls become much more likely to develop depression. And actually, the lifetime prevalence of depression is almost twice as high in women than it is for men. And so this really drives home the point and tells us that something is going on at the level of the brain, especially um, the impact of female sex hormones on brain development that can set the stage for this later on. Across puberty and adolescence, there are also specific neurodevelopmental trajectories that take place. So I have different graphs here, one for total brain volume, gray matter, and white matter. And what we see is, um, well, first of all, the red line denotes females and the blue line represents males. So for total cerebral volume, we see it peaking earlier for girls and in boys. And there's also a greater decline in total brain volume for females in the second decade of life. Gray matter development typically follows an inverted U trajectory across puberty and adolescence. The right cap, the right cap, the so the research has shown that it typically peaks in late, adult, um, in late childhood, early adolescence, and gradually begins to decline later on. 
And again, we see the peak happening earlier for girls than boys. White matter, on the other hand, tends to increase across adolescence in both sexes. But the rate of increase is greater for males than it is for females. So even during puberty and early adolescence, we see a lot of significant brain changes happening that are specific to women only and that are different from men. To also add to the regulatory benefits that the oral contraceptive pill can have on young women, they could also have some potential adverse consequences, especially with early onset. So for starters, the birth control pill in some studies has been linked to an increase in breast cancer. And the synthetic hormones and oral contraceptives have the, have the potential to damage the DNA of undeveloped breast cells in young girls perhaps leading to even more increased risk. Also, some studies have found that after a longer continuation of birth control, women report more infertility issues and actually take a longer time to reach a state of fertility compared to women who've used it for a shorter period of time or never at all. And the third point is actually um, a newspaper article that made its way in popular media just a couple of years ago. Some of you may or may not have seen it, and this was a longitudinal Danish study that followed over a million women, and it found that oral contraceptive use was associated with an increased risk of developing depression and also using antidepressants. And this increased relative risk was actually higher for adolescents that were on the pill. So taking into account that birth control does have an effect on a woman's brain structure and function, and that there is a trend toward earlier onset, during which there's already important brain changes happening, taking all this information together, it brings us to my current study. And the leading research question of my study is to see whether the intake of synthetic hormones during a vulnerable period of development can have long-term neuroplastic consequences. So if a young girl is to start taking birth control during puberty and she needs these synthetic hormones in the pill to continue her brain development and remodeling, can it have a long-term effect on brain structure and function? And for my presentation today, I'll be presenting preliminary data on white matter volume and emotional working memory. And I'm looking at three groups in particular, early onset users, late onset users, and naturally cycling non-users. So, so far, I've collected data from 25 women that are naturally cycling non-users. And I actually scanned these women in different parts of their menstrual cycle. I've also collected data from 15 oral contraceptive users, of which five are considered early onset and 10 are considered late onset. The intended sample size for my study is 75 participants, so I'm hoping to enroll 15 women per group. And my participants are recruited from undergraduate psychology courses as well as the community. So to move on into inclusion criteria, basically what we define as puberty in our lab, at least for human research, is sometime within the first six months of menarche. So all my early onset users are women who began using some kind of combined oral contraceptive pill within the first six months of getting their very first menstrual period. As I mentioned earlier, I only recruited five women so far. This group is a more difficult target group to get. But these women began using the pill anywhere from 12 years of age to 14 years of age. My late onset users are women who began using the pill after 18 years of age and they must have been on the pill for a minimum of three months. So the idea here is to really catch women who began using birth control during an important period where brain development is happening, and women who began using it later where brain development is near the end of its trajectory, it's near the end of its development. Again, this is hard to quantify in humans. I come from an animal lab, so it's more easier to do in that sense. But these are the criteria we've established right now for early versus late onset users. And for our naturally cycling non-participants, we're also interested in the effects of endogenous sex steroids. As there have been studies to show that women do behave differently even when it comes to brain activity patterns in different parts of their natural menstrual cycle. 
So I'm interested in looking at women in the early follicular phase, which is typically considered the low hormone phase of the natural menstrual cycle. The pre-ovulatory phase, which constitutes a, a range of high estrogen and low progesterone. And finally, the luteal phase, which is typically where progesterone levels are higher and estrogen levels are lower. And you can actually see it better depicted on this graph right here, which shows you the rises and falls of different hormones across a woman's natural menstrual cycle. So the early follicular phase is typically considered the first week of a woman's menstrual cycle. And we're defining this phase as days two to six. So we're only testing women who are between days two to six of their menstrual cycle. The pre-ovulatory phase we are considering as days 10 to 14. And finally, for the luteal phase, we're testing women between days 18 and 24 of their natural menstrual cycle. And just a couple of more inclusion criteria. So all my birth control users are women who have been using birth control continuously, meaning they have taken no discontinuing breaks from them. We are enrolling women who have been on different types of birth control, and that's actually quite common. It's really difficult to find a woman who's been on the same pill throughout her entire uh, teenage years or even reproductive life. So they are, it is okay for them to have switched birth control as long as it's some kind of combined pill, meaning that it contains estrogen and progesterone. And we're scanning women in the active phase of their hormonal contraceptive regime meaning that we're testing them sometime within the 21 days where they're actively taking the synthetic hormones. For my naturally cycling non-user participants, I make sure to screen them for regular menstrual cycles. And again, that's really hard to define and different studies on the menstrual cycle will tell you different things. But basically what I've gathered from the previous research is that a regular menstrual cycle is considered anywhere from 24 to 32 days. And these women especially have not skipped any menstrual periods in the last three months. And we actually are using a forward date count to classify women in different menstrual groups. And at the end of the study, we intend on verifying their endogenous hormone levels through saliva sample analyses. And finally, all my participants are screened to make sure that they do not have any medical or psychiatric conditions and that they're always metal free and MRI compatible. So my scanning procedure is actually a bit shorter compared to some other studies. In total, it's about 40 minutes. We start off with two structural scans that take about 10 minutes in total. We have the T1 and T2. And finally, we have the NBAC task, which is my task that's measuring emotional working memory. Finally, we finish with a DTI sequence that looks at the health of white matter. And finally, resting state. For the resting state in particular, we ask our participants to keep their eyes closed and not think of anything in particular, just let their minds wander. So the NBAC task, I'm just gonna go over this in a bit detail because I do have functional data from this task today. So basically this task is a continuous performance task that's used to measure working memory. You can kind of think of it as a game of concentration where the participant is presented with a sequence of stimuli, in our case, it's emotionally arousing pictures, and she has to press the response pad to indicate when she sees a picture that she saw N pictures before in the sequence. So the load factor N can be adjusted to make the task as easy as you want it or as difficult as you want it. And our task is devised from images that are taken from the International Effective Picture System, which is a database of emotionally arousing images. So the images can be classified in three emotional categories, positive, negative, and neutral, and our load factor N goes up to two, resulting in a total of six trials, and there are rests in between. So just to give you an example of what the trials look like, this is an example of the one back negative trial. So the red asterisk signifies when a participant would have to press the response pad. So in that case, she would have to press the response pad when she sees the second negative picture because that's a picture that she saw one picture before. And here's an example of a two back positive trial. So in this case, the participant is pressing 
the response pad when she sees the image of the three dogs the second time because that's the image that she saw two pictures before and that's denoted by the arrows at the bottom. So one picture before is the picture of the couple, two pictures before is the same picture of the three dogs. And the task might look a little difficult now or confusing, but we do give our participants a trial version of the task before they enter the scanner. And we also remind them of the instructions before we start it, while they're in the scanner. So overall, I would say our participants are fairly comfortable and competent at this task. For my data analysis, I used SPM8, the structural parametric um, mapping software, to look at my structural data, and SPM12 to look at my functional data. And it's important to note that my functional data actually is analyzed in a two-step process. So the first step is the first order analyses, where we look at the individual level. So for example, if I wanted to see where there's more brain activity for the two-back negative condition, compared to the one back negative condition, I would do this contrast for every single one of my participants. And I would then highlight the areas where there's more brain activity in the two back negative compared to the one back negative. And the second order analysis, or the second step, is actually looking at the group comparisons. So now that I've kind of standardized all my participants so that they're showing more brain activity for one condition than the next, now I'm going to look at my group differences, whether it's birth control users in general compared to non-users, early onset versus late onset, or even women across different phases of the natural menstrual cycle. And all my group comparisons are assessed using independent samples t-tests. So for my structural results, I just have white matter volume data to present today. But basically what I found when I compared all my birth control users against all my non-users is that women on the pill are actually showing more white matter volume in the right insula compared to their non-using counterparts. And this structure is very noteworthy to mention because it does send signals to the limbic system which is, can essentially be thought of as our emotional brain. And women on the pill have been shown to display differences in emotional reactivity compared to non-users. Also, I was then interested to see whether a shorter duration on birth control can have an effect on white matter volume. So are these white matter volume changes we're seeing, are they acute? Or does it happen with a longer duration? And so in that case, I actually selected five late onset users who've been using birth control for a short period of time. So these women have been using the pill anywhere from 4 months to 12 months, and I compared them with my five early onset users. And what I found is that my early onset users are actually showing more white matter in the left mid-temporal gyrus compared to their late onset short duration counterparts, which I thought was really interesting. For the functional data, what I first did was that I compared all my birth control users against all non-users just because I already have a small sample size and it would give me more power that way to look at 25 versus 5, I'm sorry, 15, instead of independent groups. Um, and so what I noticed overall was that women on birth control are showing more brain activity for both positive and negative working memory compared to naturally cycling women. And what's interesting to note here is that the increased brain activity is actually localized more in the frontal areas of the brain. So for the first comparison I did, I wanted to isolate working memory for negative pictures. So this is represented by the two back negative minus one back negative condition. And what I found was that women on birth control are actually showing more activity bilaterally in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and greater activity in the left superior parietal lobe compared to naturally cycling women. And other areas that actually I didn't have pictures for but that they did show increased activity were the right supplementary motor area and somewhere in the midbrain that I believe to be the periaqueductal gray area. For positive memory, women on birth control also showed increased activation in the inferior frontal cortex and in these three brain regions here. So for A, we have the left mid temporal gyrus. For B, we have the left posterior cingulate. And for C, we have, oh sorry, I'm sorry, that was my mistake. 
Uh, for A, we have the left superior frontal cortex, B is the midtemporal gyrus, and C represents the left posterior cingulate. So again, what we're seeing is that women on birth control are showing more activity uh, for positive working memory than their naturally cycling counterparts. And finally, I was interested to see the regions where women are showing more brain activity for negative working memory than positive working memory. And again, I found that women on birth control are showing more activation in the left lingual gyrus. So another brain region compared to their naturally cycling counterparts. And I know when you see all these different brain regions, it's hard to come up with you know, a reason for why we might be seeing a certain set of brain regions for one type, another set for another type. So this is very preliminary data and the group sizes are very uneven. But what's the most noteworthy thing to mention here is that regardless of emotional condition, women on the pill are showing more brain activity than their naturally cycling counterparts. I was also then interested to see the comparison between early and late onset users. And for these analyses, I actually did not separate the late onset users depending on their duration. So I'm just looking at all 10 late onset compared to my five early onset. So again, keep in mind this data is very preliminary because the sample size of the late onset is double the size of the early onset. And the results here are not as clear cut so basically, early onset users are showing more activity than late onset users in certain regions, and you see the reversal in other regions. And this is really dependent on the emotional condition, which we'll see, which we'll see shortly, and I think it's pretty interesting how it works out. And again, what I'm seeing is that the increased activation, at least where late onset users show more than early onset users, is again localized in the frontal areas of the brain. And because we saw earlier that birth control users in general are showing more activity in frontal areas compared to naturally cycling non-users, it seems that maybe the late onset users are driving this effect. But again, the sample sizes are very unequal, so I'll know more when I finish data collection. But that's the trend I'm seeing right now. So for negative working memory, Early onset users showed more activation in the right superior parietal cortex, which is denoted by figure A. However, late onset users showed more activity in the right inferior frontal cortex, which is denoted by image B. And same thing for positive working memory. Um, you see the late onset users showing more activity in a frontal region of the brain. So here we have the right mid frontal cortex, which is image B, but the early onset users are showing more activity in the left insula. And going back to our white matter results, we found that women on the pill in general are showing more white matter volume compared to non-users. And so what I'm thinking here is that maybe it's the early onset users that are really driving this effect. For the white matter volume, it was the right insula, and here we're seeing the left. So I'm still learning more myself about brain imaging and the data analysis. But it could be that maybe for the early onset users, so whether it's because they've been on it for a longer period of time or they went on it during a vulnerable period of development, the increase in white matter volume is translating to more activity. But again, this is only for one emotional condition that I've identified and it's not consistent across the other conditions. And finally, I was interested to see again where there's more activity for negative working memory than positive working memory. And I see early onset users showing more brain activity in the right mid cingulum, and adult onset users showing more activity in the right inferior frontal cortex. And obviously the frontal area of the brain is very large, so it can be divided and you know, classified in different clusters. But overall what I'm seeing by just comparing five early onset users and 10 late onset users is that it's really the late onset users that are showing more frontal activity and the early onset users are showing less activity. So I think there is something going on there. So overall, when I looked at the structural data, women on birth control in general are showing more white matter volume in the insula. And they're also showing more brain activity for working memory and all of the emotional conditions I've identified. And as I mentioned earlier, the insula does send signals to limbic system, so it could be that this increase in white matter is giving rise through neural circuitry differences and more brain activation. 
Estrogen has also been associated with an increase in positive mood, and it's shown to be protective against negative mood and mental health disorders, such as depression-like and anxiety-like behavior. And we do know, um, you know, just from word of mouth and also current research that's being done on the pill, that the synthetic hormones in the birth control pill do modulate effective processes. And so it could be that the synthetic estrogen in the birth control pill is impairing or somehow differing how birth control users process emotionally arousing stimuli, which results in different brain activity patterns for the different emotional conditions. And this could be regardless of whether women started later or earlier or have been on it for a longer period of time or shorter period of time, it could really just be attributed to the synthetic hormones and the pill. For the early onset users and the late onset users comparison, we saw late onset users showing more activity predominantly in the frontal areas of the brain. And from this, we can conclude that the early onset users are showing blunted activity for working memory of the different emotional conditions. And we do know that in puberty, it's a time of brain development, the brain is restructuring itself, reorganizing itself, and one of the structures that undergoes profound change is the prefrontal cortex. And so it could be that maybe, just maybe, pharmacological intervention of birth control at an earlier age during a more vulnerable period of development can affect the differentiation of neural circuits, other kind of signal processing that can potentially result in this blunted activity. So again, it's very preliminary. There's only 10 and five in the comparison, but I think there is something going on here, especially because we see more frontal areas being highlighted uh, for late onset users and their early onset counterparts. And so the implications of oral contraceptive research is that I think it really expands the body of knowledge on what synthetic hormones can do to a woman's brain structure and function. And I think the implications are not only important at the individual level, so example, for example, helping women make more informed choices about whether to take birth control, but they're also relevant at more of the basic science and clinical research levels. So more and more women are participating in scientific studies, but let alone controlling for the use of hormonal contraception, many studies still don't take into account sex differences between men, um, men and women. So I think this research really encourages other studies in the behavioral neurosciences field and also more of the psychological studies that take into this account, that take sex hormones and sex differences into account. And finally, the effects of female sex hormones, I think, should be taken into account when designing MRI studies. So if you're interested in comparing men and women, um, it could be that if you have a group of women and some are on the pill and some aren't on the pill, um, the differences between men and women could either be masked or further amplified. So I think this is a really important point to consider just for future research in psychology in general. Um, with that being said, there are general limitations to studying female sex hormones and the birth control pill. So number one is the healthy user bias. So obviously I am scanning women who choose to be on the pill. So women who've experienced some serious mood, um, you know, mood side effects or just physical side effects will discontinue the pill. So I am already working with a healthy sample as is. Another thing is that my study is retrospective versus longitudinal. So I'm not scanning women when they started the pill and you know a couple of years after. I'm asking women to think back in time about when they first started and how long they've been on it. And I can tell you just from doing the data collection, it's really hard for the early onset users just because we have a very strict criteria is that they have to have started using birth control sometime within the first six months of menarche, and that can be really hard to remember back, especially because my participants are all between the ages of 18 and 25. So that's another thing. Um, ideally, you'd want to do a more longitudinal design and catch women right when they first go on the pill and follow them periodically. And also, the effects of oral contraceptive discontinuation have not been studied, and that's quite obvious since it's only now starting to be studied in 
um, in a healthy normal sample. So again, that's another issue with data collection. Uh, sometimes we'll have participants who have been on the pill, then discontinued it for two, three years, and then gone back, and it's hard to really classify them as to whether you know, they should be considered naturally cycling or late onset users or even early onset users. So that's another thing. Once there's more research on this, I think it would be really interesting to look at the effects of discontinuation and whether the effects are more long lasting or acute. So for example, does the brain kind of bounce back, you could say, from, take, from stopping the pill? So the remaining work for my study um, is that I'm still currently doing data collection to reach my intended sample size of 75 participants. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when I was talking about the naturally cycling women, I am planning to look at endogenous sex hormone levels through saliva sample analyses. So that'll be one thing to do after as well. Um, we also have performance data for this study. So I didn't present it today, but I am interested to look at the reaction times and the errors. So could it be that birth control users in general are performing the same as naturally cycling users, but they're still showing more brain activity patterns? Or could it be that their brains are, I guess you could say, working harder for the different conditions because they're making more errors and they're finding the task more difficult? So it's one thing to consider as well. And also we have DTI and resting state analyses that can be done. So one thing that I did mention in the existing research is that some research labs are finding differences in resting state actually between women on the pill and off the pill. And the differences they're finding are in networks that have been implicated in mood disorders like depression and anxiety. So I think functional connectivity during resting state would also be another very interesting thing to look at. And I'd like to acknowledge um, some very important people who were able to make this project possible. So my PhD supervisor, Dr. Nafisa Ismail, also Andrew Smith, who has been collaborating with us and has been teaching me everything I know about brain imaging. We have some really great honor students who have helped me with data collection and recruitment. And the brain imaging staff who have answered all my questions and put up with my constant emails about <laughs> just everything in general, and our funding sources. So this project is actually funded by the School of Psychology. So when this um, facility was built, uh, the School of Psychology is actually trying to encourage more research labs to start brain imaging projects and just to like at least collect pilot data. So they've been a really good funding source. And we recently got funding from the Memory and Cognition Group of the Brain and Mind Research Institute. So that has also been very helpful. And thank you so much. That concludes my presentation today. Um, again, my data is very preliminary, but I think it's headed in a very interesting step. And I look forward to seeing what the results are after I've completed the entire data collection. And thank you again for having me at the speak seminar. Thank you. Why do you conclude that having less brain activity during memory, with memory is a bad thing? Or did you? I guess you know you referred to having blunted. Yeah, so just based on what the research has shown on the birth control pill in general, um, you know, how brain structures are different and have been implicated in more mood and anxiety like disorders. Um, I guess I, I am concluding right now that it may be a negative thing, but Obviously, with more participants, we'll be able to see. And again, by looking at the performance data as well. Yeah, yeah. But in, independent of whatever groups you're looking at, like, you know, if you have a certain amount of brain activity when you do a task, more isn't necessarily better. Like, so the way you could look at that is, does it look at performance? I don't, I don't know. I missed it, but did you show any data on performance of the task? Oh no, no. I'm still analyzing that. Yeah, because yeah. that's pretty important to. See of course, of course, yeah. Because. Um, like for instance, some some NBAC tasks are really easy, so you can't really look at performance because mm -hmm. everybody's close to ceiling. Do you think that might be the case for your task? Um, so we haven't gotten really far along in analyzing the performance data um, based on just you know the recruitment process. The participants do seem fairly comfortable with the task. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of 
you know, error rates and reaction times of the contraceptive users are probably similar than the non-users. Again, it is also a healthy undergraduate population, but you're right, it would be interesting to factor yeah, that it's, in. Yeah, it's really important because if, say, they're, they are the same, even on reaction time, then, then actually the ones who have less brain activity are doing better because they're more efficient. Right. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's, I think, one of the things I mentioned in my presentation, that after we take into account the performance data, if we do find that the contraceptive users are performing similarly to the non-users, but at the brain level, they're showing more brain activity, um, it could signify that, you know, their brains are having to work harder to reach the same performance data. Yeah. And how do you threshold that data? Show, like you see where you know, show where the effects are in different parts of the brain, but are those like, significant? Like, yeah, so different? all of the images for the brain regions I've showed, um, the threshold is at 0 0.05, and some of the data is at uncorrected p-values, whereas some are at corrected p-values, but again, I just showed that because um, it is a small sample size yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yes. Very good presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you, you indicated that people who are on contraceptives are more likely to develop depression. And I was wondering whether you're collecting any data on the depressive symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. So before um, the participants go on the scanner, we are administering the BDI and STAI. And one of the things for future directions is to see if BDI scores can relate to brain activity or even the differences in structure, yeah. But as of right now, I'm not seeing significant differences between the groups. So yeah. women are reporting more or less similar BDI scores. Yeah. And the other question I had was, did I hear you correctly, you saw differences in the very critical gray area? Yes, I believe that's the area. So I'm still learning um, the SPM software. Right. Um, and basically, I identified one MNI coordinate that I entered into you know, like the magical brain atlas. And from the cluster size restrictions and everything, I'm trying to figure out what that cluster is. So I think it could be the periaqueductal gray area, but I'm not 100% confirmed on that. Because yeah. if that were the case, I would question yeah. that um, is there any literature on Sensitivity and, and the natural cycle. Um, and the natural menstrual cycle, yes, mm -hmm. I think there is. Because you might want to, because right. if you're very critical, create changes, mm -hmm. we indicate that there, there are differences in the sensitivities. Yeah. So you might have that in the way that's really but that could be another picture. Okay. That's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry if I missed it at the beginning, but uh, could you say again, or um, say, what governs whether someone becomes a very early in life user of the pill, and whether any of those factors might actually serve as confounds here? Mm -hmm. um, so what constitutes an early onset user from our definition is- What, what determines that? So, uh, okay. so you know, is the, um, yeah, uh, regularity, uh, hormonal skin uh, uh, effects, uh, mood uh, mm -hmm. fluctuations very early on that then the parents say, oh, you're, you're going to start using taking this Right, skills. right. Yeah, that's a very good point, and it definitely can be a confounding factor if it is based on mood. Right now, out of the five women I've enrolled, um, all of them have reported going on the pill either for um, you know, like actual birth control or for regulatory purposes. Um, just to kind of put it in perspective, we've been going on the pill for such various reasons. I actually had one early onset user who started the pill at age 12 for swimming purposes. So she was a swimmer and her parents just wanted to really, um, you know, make her go to the top for swimming and she didn't want to experience any mental periods anymore and went on. So, so far, um, I haven't recruited anyone specifically who's been an early onset specifically for mood or any of the mood symptoms that come with PMS. Yeah. And we also, again, we screen for medical conditions. Um, so 
one of the conditions that warrants swing on the pill is polycystic ovarian syndrome, and we haven't recruited anyone who reported going on the pill early on for that reason. So all of our participants are medically healthy and um, psychiatrically healthy. Sort of a similar type of question, just sort of curious about your sample, really, um, and the different the differences between the groups. It's sort of interesting to have this, this group of women that have gone on, and it sounds like all of them actually at a fairly early age, and those that just have never been on the mm -hmm. And if there are sort of demographics, socioeconomic, education, you know, they have different kinds of achievement. Like, there's so many, there's so, yeah. so many things you could consider right. that may right. be informative or, or actually interesting. I'm just wondering if you're sort of collecting as much information about the, the individuals themselves. Um, so in terms of the BDI and STAI right now, um, the only other demographics we're collecting is, you know, your study and program. Um, a lot of our participants with Model you would know are from ISPR. Um, so we're not collecting more um, of the descriptive demographic uh, information or more personality measures, but that is a really interesting point to consider. So they're all university educated? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, they're all first year or higher, yeah. So there, just to clarify, there's no age differences between the early onset and the late onset users currently in your sample, I know it's quite small, right? Yeah, so there's no age differences, um, that's why it's sort of retrospective design, so the women that we're scanning right now, we're asking them to think back as to right. when. But yeah. in terms of the means, there's clearly oh, no, no differences. No. Um, but it, just to follow up on what uh, Patrick and Stuart were saying, I know it's really difficult to change things as a study is already going, but it is a valid point to, uh, I, and perhaps you're already doing mm -hmm. this, is asking why you're on the pill. Because I think what maybe Patrick was suggesting um, is there might be very different reasons, and perhaps it may be something like personality related or environmental, as in like, okay, if most of these individuals are actually athletes, right. where controlling the menstrual cycle is more important, like is, is that sort of more associated with a certain uh, personality trait? And we do know that right. that does play a role. And I mean, that could be a kind of a simple modification. To yeah, 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 that's very interesting. Yeah. It's just uh, something that's yeah. sort of in the literature. But my question was actually, um, and again, I understand this is the way you want to emphasize, but when you were looking for the white matter, mm -hmm. um, did you include overall white matter volume as a covariant? And no, we did not. So that's like yeah. kind of thinking of like publications. Right. Those are the sorts of things you, because it's very easy to find of course. Uh, differences when yeah. you don't include covariants like that. So just, again, right. I understand that this is sort of at the beginning, but yeah. just keep that in mind. Okay, yeah. I just learned the BBM A toolbox, so um, yeah. I was really excited to show the data, but definitely, yeah, I have much more to learn, um, so yeah, but this is a good first step. Yeah? Okay, so in my study, we're controlling for the, what's it called, the follicular stage? Yeah, so the low hormone, yeah. We're yeah. trying to do that, and we are aware of whether people are taking birth control. I have a lot of post-menopausal women. Okay. How would I account for like all of those? Or how would you, <laughs> like, if you're suggesting that you want to account for whatever right. phase they're in, right? Right. So there be differences in different phases. You want to account for whether they're on birth control or not. Mm -hmm. And you also have people who are post oh, so, 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 right. Um, you do so all the time. So the first, thing, the first thing that comes up to me actually is, yeah. are you asking the postmenopausal women if they're on some kind of hormone replacement therapy? Yeah, you have that information. Okay. Well. Okay. So. Okay. So just based on what I know of the menstrual cycle, and again, the rises and falls in different hormone levels, I would imagine the postmenopausal women to be similar to the early follicular okay. when there's low estrogen and progesterone. Um, so the, low, the early follicular phase is that one week where women are experiencing their menstrual period. Um, so yeah, I think. But at that point, it's like really difficult to control these girls elderly, well not elderly, but you know, most menopausal is generally, you know, yeah. Yeah. than 20. So you're also looking at just the compound of like, yes, modulated hormones, but also just in age and time, so. Yeah. Are you still like cycles? No. That might be helpful to you, because then you can get measures of the hormones. So are you just doing a forward day count then, or? 
Yeah. When, okay. So I'm taking the date of their last menstrual period and how long they're on their list. Okay, okay. And attempting to scan them in the first 10 days, actually. So we're not doing like two to six, you know, our studies yeah. don't develop this at all. Right, right. Right. Yeah, right. yeah as what I think it would be. Um, as my supervisor mentioned, to collect saliva samples yeah. um, because you actually can detect a lot of sex hormones uh, through saliva. So estrogen and progesterone are just what I'm doing, but you can look at testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, so the hormone like right above that gets converted to testosterone. Um, so I think that would be really good to maybe incorporate. And it's also relatively inexpensive too um, to collect the samples, so yeah. Yeah? Um, so you're looking at an emotional task, I mean, that's probably for low-hanging fruit reasons, you know, this is an early sort of first step in this yeah. direction, so yeah. you know, you've got to go with what works, but do you think this might generalize to other forms of cognition, information processing, memory, or skills, and all sorts of other? <laughs> um, I think so. Uh, so the research right now is pretty mixed based on what I've, I've been reading. But for example, the brain, like the functional data I've been seeing is that women on the pill do show differences in brain activity when it comes to phase processing or verb generation tasks. One, uh, one study I thought that was really interesting actually was that they found that women on the pill are showing similar brain activation patterns to men when they're doing numerical tasks. So I think I definitely would like to look at different types of cognitive tasks and also to incorporate men um, and future studies too, because even right now it would be really interesting to see if women on the pill are showing similar or more or less brain activity patterns to men as well. Because they do have suppressed endogenous sex hormones, right? So it would be interesting to see there if they're behaving similar to men. Okay. Anyone else? Okay,